when a change proposal happens, like what for people that don't like understand, like what is a change proposal? I mean, it's kind of self-descriptive. It's a proposal for a change. Right, right. But like people don't really have an understanding of like what that means internally in the project, like how this is handled, like what like what sort of process okay. is done with it. So it basically starts from someone has an idea mm -hmm. and they want to do something that is that is marketable and project or project wide. Mm -hmm. One of the two. A lot of times you see changes as stuff that's like, well, why do I care? Well, someone is proud about it and it's something self-contained. And so that's a lot of self-contained changes are things that they want to advertise at a project level that they're doing that they think is cool. Mm -hmm. But system wide changes are changes that are essentially descriptions of things that were changing across the whole distribution. Mm -hmm. And that's where things that tend to be affecting release blocking status have multiple stakeholders, that sort of thing. Um, change proposals are fundamentally, someone has sat down long enough to think about the consequences of what they want to do, and mm -hmm. they wrote it out. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we go through this process is actually twofold. The first reason is to make sure that all the things have been thought of from the community perspective so that it can be deliberated by the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, FESCO. Mm -hmm. The second reason is less obvious. This is how RHEL can silently accept or reject any change that has been made into Fedora for RHEL. Mm -hmm. So some pulling back the curtain thing, every single change that gets submitted into Fedora and then gets on FESCO's desk is then mirrored into Red Hat internally to also make a separate in decision by the RHEL Council. Mm -hmm. So the RHEL Council functions the same way that Fesco does. Mm -hmm. And they make the same kinds of decisions for RHEL. So they do technical decisions, they do marketing decisions, they do uh, focus decisions, they do structural decisions, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the RHEL Council and Fesco, the RHEL Council being Red Hat internal only, Fesco being the public one that represents Fedora, those two sides make judgments independently of the same change. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, the change to add frame pointers in Fedora 38. Mm -hmm. The Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, after lots of debate, hot and, and, and craziness, and me burning capital all over the place, you know, uh, to, to make it happen. Um, the Red Hat side, um, the RHEL Council declined to accept the change at that time. That means that as things currently stand right now, unless they decide to change their mind sometime between now and, I don't know, whenever they decide their cutoff is for when they want to make big changes like this, mm -hmm. um, which for all I know is like the end of this year or something like that, because mm -hmm. RHEL 10 is going to release in May 2025. Like, that's that's a given RHEL 9 released in May 2022. Three years from May 2022 is May 2025. If you can't math, I can't help you. Um, so uh, sometime between now and then, um, if Red Hat decides that they want to accept the change, they can incorporate it as part of that. And then they do the same process that we do, which is when that change is accepted, people are able to implement it, and it gets recorded in as part of release notes and documentation. So a change proposal includes the statement of the description of change, the statement of change, the rationale of the change, and the mechanics of the change and the documentation of the change. Mm -hmm. Each of these things are filled in over time or adjusted or refined and eventually exported to make it for the rest of the, the stuff, the mm -hmm. rest of the process, which is marketing for when they do it on social media or in magazine posts. They do it for documentation by throwing it into um things like uh the release notes and the and and uh the manuals and things like that fedora doesn't produce manuals anymore we used to mm -hmm. we don't anymore um but that used to be part of the process where we would we would make those and pull those things into manuals um but realm does like so they take those that same information and they use it to feed into their 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 books that they have on docs.redhat.com uh, about red hat enterprise linux documentation mm -hmm. um and then the last part is it's a record of what, what has been done to evolve the project. 
and to evolve the distribution. And this is actually the most important factor because other distributions use Fedora's change records as a way to do their own changes. Um, it is very common to see another distribution say, oh yeah, we want to do this. Here's what Fedora did and here's how they did it. Mm -hmm. Let's more or less take that and, and implement it ourselves. I firmly believe this is a big part of why Fedora has such a strong leadership aspect to it, mm -hmm. because we're one of the few distributions that writes everything down. So as an example, you would be this is something like um, the recently Arch is changing their VM max map count. And I believe in their yep. thing, they reference Fedora. They reference the Fedora change. Yeah. I mean, the frame pointers stuff. So Arch has turned on frame pointers. That also references the Fedora change. Mm -hmm. um, Ubuntu, they turned on frame pointers and they didn't reference us, which I'm a little salty about because we did. They're also doing VMX map, map count. I don't know if they mentioned it in their thing, but that is also happening. They there. didn't. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it's hit or miss whether they wind up mentioning Fedora for things that we've done first. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know why that's the case because like, it's not unusual for if Ubuntu does something first that we mention it. And, and it would be nice if it happened. It probably comes up in Ubuntu. internal discussions whether they mention it publicly or not. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's almost certainly happening in internal discussions, but it should happen. Public acknowledgement is uh, is generally appreciated. Right. Lots of distributions do this. So, like, you know, you look at OpenSUSE, um, for example, when we moved to Z standard compression for RPM mm -hmm. in 2019, 2020, um, OpenSUSE, when they made the change, they referenced the Fedora change and the rationale for doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Arch Linux, when they moved to Z standard, referenced the Fedora change, even though theirs went out to users faster, mm -hmm. our change came first. So, so like that was like, this happens a lot. And, and it, I think it's actually very valuable because it lets people understand why things are happening mm -hmm. and they can choose to disagree if they want. I mean, Red Hat does it with RHEL and SUSE does it with OpenSUSE sometimes, mm -hmm. But if they don't disagree with it, then at least they know, you know, at least everyone knows what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really the biggest function of what a change actually, a change document's for. Mm -hmm. When it is a proposal, it is an intention and it's a description of what the, what it, you intend to do. When it is done, it is a description of what you have done. Right. And why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it makes sense. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So then if you look at that from that lens and you look at every change proposal that's ever been made in Fedora, mm -hmm. a lot of things start lining up. Like, how is Fedora a leader? How is all these other distributions like able to quickly implement some of the same things that Fedora does? It's because we write it all down. Um, but it, like, if you look at things that originate from other distributions, so for mm -hmm. example, um, OpenSUSE started doing the thing where they moved their, they moved distribution provided configuration files to a directory and user. They never mm -hmm. actually outlined it anywhere. They never d documented what they're doing and why. Their rationales are not clearly written out in one place. So it is actually difficult for other distributions to copy what they did. Right. So everyone else does it differently now. And so there's this incoherence that happens as a result of it. So OpenSUSE does things in user Etsy, mm -hmm. which, again, I personally think that's a, not a good directory path to put things in. But that's what they went with. Fedora puts them in either user share or user lib or somewhere else that makes sense relative to the individual package. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have um, you have uh, Solus and Serpent that does it in user share defaults. Okay. And because they have this whole stateless Linux thing and they have, it's not fully written out anywhere, but they have this whole thing of they, they put everything in user shared defaults and those are all there. And then they have their software patch to look at that location first and then find all the other ones. That's their whole concept of stateless Linux, which is where all this actually started from. Mm -hmm. But because this was never coherently described in a way that everyone could understand the, the, the starting point, the rationale and the end state, everybody's doing it differently because no one knows what the right way is supposed to be and why. I see. So by having everything written down, it makes it clear what is happening for Dora, and it makes it clear that it also makes it easy to coordinate between different distros. Right. The biggest thing that the big that's a really a side effect. The really important reason for this is it means that you everyone understands what's going on. 